So what I feel Canada is doing is they're still unilaterally imposing identity. Tonight, as Canada tries to clean up its discrimination, defining Indian status remains a central point of debate. It's clear that you know, courts do want to send a message. Pipeline protesters who defied an injunction could face jail time. The cart is slightly ahead of the horse, but unless you legalize, you can't do the research. And a Senate committee hears from physicians as it grapples with what regulations ought to be in the Cannabis Act. Good evening, I'm Beverly Andrews. Welcome to the APTN National News. Their strength in numbers is an old saying that doesn't always hold true, at least not to a collection of Iroquois nations who are holding a summit in Aquanasosne to discuss who should and who should not be considered part of the Iroquois. Tom Fenario has more. Addressing the threat to our nations. That's the description for this two-day conference on membership and citizenship. So what I feel Canada is doing is they're still unilaterally imposing identity on our people. It's all a part of a big assimilation process is the way we see it. Chief Kasana Hawaii Sky Deer helped organize this Iroquois caucus meeting. Many Mohawks here are concerned about a potential boom in people with Indian status. You know, at one fell swoop, there's going to be uh, 1.2 million new Indians that are going to be created according to Canada's standards without us having any input. Behind this possible increase is Bill S-3. Born out of the Supreme Court's Deschano decision, Bill S-3 is an act to end gender-based discrimination in the Indian Act. This means that Indigenous women who had children with non-Indigenous men before 1985 would gain status that was refused to them before. But one amendment wants to extend it all the way to Confederation, as opposed to the original proposed cutoff of 1951. As a result, Sky Deer estimates that Ganawage could see up to 36,000 new members. And for her, there's no strength to be had in more numbers. We're already fighting with, for the minimal resources that we already have, the minimal lands that we have available uh, for people to live on. And then do these people even think like First Nations, Ungwehunwe, Indigenous people, you know, we're, we're trying to protect um, a way of life. The Iroquois Caucus made a point of inviting elders and representatives of other traditional governments. Gana Saraga is an elder from Aguasasne Bear Clan. He says Indian status is a colonial construct and would prefer that the gathering focus on traditional teachings. We need to remember it's European land claims and that's what they're discussing here. How are they going to go about in, in saving the standing that we have in our own land, our own homeland? Sky Deer also finds the concept of Indian status to be distasteful. But she says the stakes are too high to not engage with Canada when it comes to deciding who gets it or who doesn't. However, when asked about what the Iroquois caucus intends to do about it, Sky Deer keeps her cards close to her chest. I don't want to be presumptuous in what kind of action steps or positions that are going to be developed as a result of this summit. For us, it was important to just have the tip of the iceberg starting the conversation and dialogue. Although Bill S-3 has already received royal assent, the 1951 removal will be consulted on. On their website, Indigenous and Northern Affairs states that consultations will begin in April. But they were unable to respond by deadline as to whether this target will be met. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Aguasasne, Mohawk Territory. In the Yukon, the Kwanlin Dun First Nation held a memorial march to honor the lives of four people connected to their community who have been killed. And so far, no charges have been laid in any of those deaths. Shirley McLean brings us this story. Members of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and other residents of Whitehorse marched to honor the memory of Wendy Carlick and Sarah McIntosh. Both women were found dead in McIntosh's home on the morning of April 19th of 2017. Police believe both women were killed. Friends and family of 53-year-old Sarah McIntosh describe her as a person who had a heart of gold and a soft soul, who would never hurt anybody. Her daughter Carrie says the last year has been horrendous, but she is finding the strength to speak today. Every day, all the time. I dream, I dream about her, that's pretty much it. 
51-year-old Wendy Carlick was an advocate for the murdered and missing. She was the mother of Angel Carlick, a 19-year-old Casca woman found murdered in a wooded area outside of Whitehorse in 2007. Her killing remains unsolved. Marchers were also remembering 45-year-old Greg Dawson, also from Kualan Dunn, who was found in a Whitehorse home on April 6 of 2017. Police say foul play could not be ruled out in his death. We haven't heard any much of anything from anybody on what's going on with it. His sister Valerie Dawson hopes for answers. We know they're gone and that, but we need closure soon. Sooner than later. Still hurts, eh? That's right. Alan Waugh is also being remembered. The 71-year-old was found deceased in a Qualandun home. His death ruled as a homicide as well. All murders remain unsolved. Chief Doris Bill says someone has information on these unsolved murders. Urge anyone with information about these cases, please come forward and help the families to resolve them. Our Justice Department here at Kwanlin Dunn can also assist if you are afraid or need assistance to bring that information forward. Last month, the RCMP announced they're opening up a cold case unit to concentrate on cases of the murdered and missing. As of today, there is no new updates. Respect your mom and much always do. You never know when they're going to go. Once they're gone, you can't see them, feel them, touch them, or hurt. For the families left behind, the pain is still too real. Cheryl McLean, APTN National News, Whitehorse. BC for, Bill C-45, also known as the Cannabis Act, continues to get hashed out in Ottawa. The Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology hears from public health officials and physicians. APTN's Annette Francis has more. Senators heard from Dr. Christine Campbell, family medicine resident for the College of Family Physicians of Canada. Dr. Campbell says that while she supports the legalization of cannabis, she would like to see a higher age limit for its use to protect the vulnerable. 15% of people who we see with um, schizophrenia and psychosis is cannabis, cannabis induced and most of this is from cannabis induced in adolescence. You're more, you're at higher risk of this happening before age 25, specifically before age 21. There's been documented white matter changes in the brain, vascular changes in the brain, um, imaging on MRIs that shows irreversible damage that comes from repeated cannabis use. The committee also heard from the executive director of the Canadian Public Health Association. He says his organization also supports the legalization of cannabis. But there's a lot of work to do in terms of public awareness campaigns geared towards youth and young adults in making healthy choices. When asked what the maximum level of the THC concentration would be to help with safe consumption, he says that's something that will have to wait. We would have liked to have seen um, maximum THC concentrations in the regulation. Um, we understand, and it's, it's a difficult position for us to be in. Our advocacy is evidence-based. Unfortunately, there's no evidence to indicate what that upper limit should be. Uh, and that's an area where, under legalization, more research will be allowed, and we should be able to set that in the future. Um, it's one of those th situations that we're finding ourselves in. The cart is slightly ahead of the horse, but unless you legalize, you can't do the research. The Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology will continue to hear from witnesses across the country over the next month. And at Francis APTN National News, Ottawa. After the break, we will go to BC, where pipeline protesters are facing criminal charges for defying a court injunction. But first, let's, like, let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Hello, I'm Todd Lamaran, and here's what's coming up on Nation to Nation. Our political panel of MPs is back this week to discuss Kinder Morgan. They debate the pros and cons of getting the pipeline built, and what it will take to do that while people are getting arrested. 
as well a parliamentary committee is studying Bill C-69. That proposed legislation is supposed to overhaul the way projects, like pipelines, are reviewed and approved. We talked to someone representing the Grand Council Decrees of Northern Quebec about C-69. That's coming up right after the national news. Showers in St. John's and plus 9, more rain and possible flurries in Halifax, plus 3. Snow in Cartwright and plus 1, sunny in Kujuac and plus 2. Cloudy in Zier and Shibugamu, Quebec City also cloudy and plus 5. North Bay will get some sun and plus 6, sunny in London and plus 5. Sun in Thunder Bay at plus 13, more sun in Wawa and plus 5. Churchill will have sun and plus 7, the Paw will be sunny and plus 8. Cloud cover and plus 10 in Barrens River, sunny and 14 in Winnipeg. Yorkton is plus 7 with more sun, some cloud cover in North Battleford and plus 11. Cloudy and plus 10 in Stony Rapids and Buffalo Narrows. BC Supreme Court judge is sending a clear message to protesters who defied an injunction at Kinder Morgan's Burnaby work sites. The protesters will be prosecuted criminally. Lori Hamlin has the details. Over 100 protesters who defied a permanent court injunction prohibiting anyone from going within five meters of Kinder Morgan's Burnaby work sites will be prosecuted with criminal contempt. It's clear that you know, courts do want to send a message that if you don't follow court orders, we have anarchy. Chilwin Chang, a lawyer for almost a dozen protesters, says the criminal contempt charge is unusual in that it's still a civil case. But because there is public defiance, the protesters can be charged criminally. What the judge has asked for is for the Attorney General of British Columbia to step in to assist in pursuing the criminal contempt of court allegations uh, in, in place of Trans Mountain Pipeline so that Trans Mountain Pipeline doesn't have to bear the costs of actually pursuing all these contempt of court cases. Chang thinks there is a possibility that the protesters could do jail time, although unlikely. It is clear under the British Columbia rules of court that jail time is a possibility as well as a fine or both. The judge presiding over the case is determined to have all files dealt with quickly, but the expedited schedule is problematic for Chang, who isn't available on certain dates. This affects his client's constitutional rights to a lawyer of their choice. The Crown has proposed is that on certain days, which are literally like every seven days, certain people are going to be put to a trial, put to a guilty verdict without any regard for whether they're available from work, whether they're available because of family, uh, whether they have lawyers who are available on that day. That's not normal at all. Normally when you're charged with an offence, there is some input from you as to whether you're available and more importantly, when your lawyer might be available. At this point, no accommodation for that, and that deeply concerns many of us in the defense bar. Trials are set to begin next month. Lori Hamlin, APTN National News, Vancouver. The head of Kinder Morgan says political infighting has reinforced his concerns about the viability of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project from Alberta to British Columbia. In a conference call, the company's CEO said significant differences between governments are outside his company's ability to resolve. BC has been obstructing the expansion of the pipeline, which would nearly triple the amount of crude traveling from Alberta to the Pacific coast. Premier, Alberta Premier Rachel Notley is insisting that despite the uncertainty, Kinder Morgan is still committed to the project. In retaliation, she is tabling legislation to restrict energy exports to B.C. On Wednesday, Newfoundland and Labrador's Children and Youth Advocate announced her office will undertake a review of Inuit children in the province's child protection system. Justin Brake has been following the story and joins us now from our studio in Ottawa. Justin, can you tell us how this review came about and what it will entail? So uh, the announcement was just made yesterday, but it follows, it comes about 10 months after the announcement uh, of uh, review into Innu children uh, in state care in Newfoundland and Labrador. Last Canada Day, Innu leaders traveled to Toronto to confront uh, Minister Carolyn Bennett at her Canada Day barbecue in her Toronto riding, demanding that something be done about the child welfare crisis in Labrador, specifically with respect to Innu children. 
Uh, so days later, the province, uh, the provincial government, announced that it would lead an inquiry into Innu children and state care in that province. And uh, Michelle Kinney, the, the, uh, the, the Deputy Minister of Health and Social Services for Nunatsiavut government, which governs the uh, Inuit of Northern Labrador, uh, said that uh, days after the announcement was made on, on the Inu inquiry, that uh, the, the Premier came to Nunatsiavut government and asked if the Inuit wanted a similar inquiry. And the response from the Inuit was that they wanted uh, a, a review, not necessarily a formal inquiry, but a review that would be collaborative and that would take into account the perspectives of elders and families who have been through the child protection uh, system in the province. So. Um, and they also said that they wanted the uh, the children and youth advocate for the province to lead that review. So this is where we're at right now. Um, Kinney did tell me uh, that um, uh, it's been a long-standing uh, problem uh, in Inuit communities with children being taken into care, and that approximately 145 uh, children of the roughly a thousand, one thousand children in Newfoundland and Labrador in state care right now are Inuit, an overrepresentation uh, in in state care. So uh, she named some of the uh, long-standing issues, the root pro uh, causes that the Inuit have identified as reasons why children are, are being in, uh, taken into state care, uh, uh, problems rooted in colonialism, uh, relocation, uh, resource development uh, in, in, uh, in the Inuit homelands. And uh, they want to see uh, these problems uh, addressed uh, in, the, in the review or taken into account. And also, they want to uh, to uh, for Inuit to have input into uh, into this review. And uh, they also, according to the the Nunatsiavut government's 2005 land claims agreement, uh, the Inuit actually have the ability to take over responsibility for child welfare um, if they can demonstrate that they can do as good of a job or better uh, a better job than the provincial government. So Kinney uh, talked a little bit about how they hope that this review process will. Will uh, will help with the uh, devolution uh, process of of uh, transferring responsibility for child welfare from the provincial government to the uh, Nunatsiavut government. So they had there's high hopes that that this will be done right and that it will give the Inuit an opportunity to take control of the situation. Uh, and uh, as Kinney uh, indicated in the interview for the story that we published yesterday, she said the main problem is that uh, right now the child welfare system is reactionary and they want to see a shift to uh, prevention which would require not only identifying the root causes and uh, solutions that are oriented uh, in uh, Inuit uh, culture, uh, um, but uh, also uh, uh, ones that can be implemented and gradually taken over by the Inuit themselves. Well, great, Justin. Thank you for talking to us. I'm sure we, we will be hearing more from you on the follow-ups on this. Okay, thanks, Bev. On tomorrow's episode of APTN Investigates, John Murray combs through cinematic archives to examine how Indigenous people have been portrayed over the decades. Here now is a preview of Cowboys and Pretendians. Personally, I should prefer to see the Aborigines. And the Indians, too. And the Indians, too. This should be the most enlightening. Uh -huh. happens on screen, reflects and shapes culture. And for Indigenous people in the industry, they see stereotypes or typecasting. The director took mud from underneath a car and put it on her face and said, you're supposed to be a dirty Indian. He's afraid to be Comanche. And red face. Are the solutions coming through Hollywood? And it's one thing for like the big Hollywood productions not to care. You kind of expect them not to care. It's been a hundred years of them not caring. Teach them all about red man. Red man. History books, your holidays, Thanksgiving lies and Columbus Day.
hardly. You can watch the whole episode of Cowboys and Pretendians tomorrow, right after the news. After the break, we'll get a look at an Indigenous gallery in a Toronto museum that is now going to be free to visit. But now, let's look at the rest of tomorrow's weather. High level in Peace River are sunny and plus 10. Cloud cover in Red Deer at plus 11. Lethbridge also has cloud, plus 13. Plus 10 and cloudy in Bellacua and Quinell. Cloud and plus 14 in Kamloops. Some showers on plus 8 in Prince George, plus 8 in cloud in Prince Rupert and Smithers. Old Crow is minus 13 with cloud cover. Watson Lake is plus 4 and cloudy. Norman Wells is cloudy and plus 9, plus 1 with cloud in Wati. Plus 20 as cloud cover in Saks Harbor and Tuk Tuk Tuk. Cloud cover and plus 3 in Whale Cove. More cloud and minus 4 in Repulse Bay. Clyde River and Paddington are sunny and at minus 6. The Royal Ontario Museum introduced a new initiative that will offer free access to an Indigenous gallery. David Moses brings us the details from Toronto. The Daphne Cockwell Gallery is dedicated to First Nations art and culture. Now you can see it for free. The Royal Ontario Museum has started offering complimentary admission to all visitors. Well, the issue of making it complimentary for all, that was really one of the guiding principles. And I should say this is a step along a road, that our goal is to say, how can we be telling stories about the Indigenous material that we hold? How can we be the best possible stewards? And how can we bring in the voices of Indigenous people to tell those stories? Louise Prophet LeBlanc sits on the Indigenous Advisory Council for the ROM and says this has been a two-year dream in the making. All of this material here belongs to our ancestors. So one of the things that has been realized, which I'm so happy to say, is that there is now free entrance to this particular gallery. And the advisory council insisted on this because one of the, one of the spiritual qualities of Indigenous people is generosity, to welcome people. gallery will welcome people with indigenous resource teachers to engage visitors. Having the First Peoples Gallery open free at the Royal Ontario Museum allows for us to engage with the community in really meaningful and authentic ways. We have staff that will activate the galleries so instead of just walking into a quiet space we'll actually have uh, conversations with folks. And those conversations will include educating and paying respect to a gallery full of ancestral objects. So as a resource teacher, I think it's important that we have um, some of those voices on deck all day long so that we can help give, give those stories to some of the objects. By offering free access to this gallery, the ROM is hoping to allow visitors a link to the past, in the present, and the future by removing barriers in support of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. David Moses, APTN National News, Toronto, Ontario. That is the APTN National Newscast for this Thursday. Stay tuned for a new episode of Nation to Nation right after this. I'm Beverly Andrews. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.